so we are here in uh, San Francisco, just at the Suda's Cafe and Bar and City Lights Bookstore. And I'm here with my lovely bride, Susan. And uh, we're about to do a video interview with uh, V. Vale. V. Vale, one of the most interesting characters uh, that I've met in recent days. So that's the setup. Here we go. All right. All right, let's go. go. You ready? Yep, I'm All on. Right. Well, here I am with V Vale, and uh, the V doesn't stand for anything we're going to reveal. That's correct. Right. There must be some mystery in life. Yeah, he's going to maintain that as uh, as, as uh, something that's uh, his own and, and in confidence. So, and we totally respect that. And uh, you know, this is just a serendipitous meeting. Susan and I walk in the streets here in um, North Beach, and uh, it turns out that Mr. Vale has been a long time resident of North Beach, and he has published, he's a writer, he's published a number of uh, interesting magazines dedicated to music, and in particular to punk rock, and uh, the first of these is called Search and Destroy. Tell us about that. How did that start? Where did you come up with a name, and what made you want to have a magazine dedicated to punk rock? Well, I lived through the hippie era, and I didn't think that at the time of the first two years of the hippie world, I didn't think any any good documentation came out. Of the hippie movement. Yeah, yeah. The, catching the real spirit. Right. Instead, you have Charles Manson, the opposite. Right. And uh, so I knew there was going to be a, another cultural revolution in 10 years. Yeah. Because the, the beatniks, yeah. and the, well, the existentialists in the 40s, the beatniks in the 50s, right. the hippies in the 60s, in the 70s, I said, it's going to be punk rock. Yeah. And so, but I didn't exactly know how to publish or anything, but I, I happen to be a huge Warhol fan. And I think 1965, I actually kind of, hitchhiked to New York to see his first big show of the, the catastrophe uh, artworks. So the electric chair, plane stuck into the ground, the crash, mm. car crashes, things like that. Right. And, um, and Warhol, who I was a huge fan of, had recently started publishing Interview Magazine. Right. And I had those earliest issues that said, I can do this. Yes. That's always a good moment when you say, I can do something. <laughs> and uh, and I, I actually use the same uh, line length and font for the text. I knew it was done on an IBM Correction Collector 2 typewriter. And we had one at City Lights, and they let me take it home. Oh, nice. I know, and bring it back in the morning. Is that an electric typewriter? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but, but the important thing was that it had a correction oh, yeah. that tape built in. Nice. And we had to buy them. Right. You, know, you could do corrections. Yes. That's super important. Yes. And um, and so I started, you know, I started research and destroy. The first issue was really small because I and I'd never done layout before, but I, by luck I met there was a tiny art gallery on the street. And, uh, and the, the person was a professional, you know, artist. Right. And he had a bunch of friends, and they all worked on, when I finally got to the layout stage, they all worked on it. And then we went to his house. And, and after that, as soon as the first issue came out. Here, hold on, we got a loud truck. Going. Okay, as soon as the first issue came out, a whole bunch of people who were really talented and skilled from the Art Institute came aboard. They all wanted to help put it out. The San and Francisco Art Institute. Yes. Yeah. And they, and you know, really good young photographers, right. artists, and, and then... This was actually, 1977? Yeah, and then people actually, after the first issue, two issues came out, people actually came to San Francisco to to work on search and destroy. I had actually had three people from Paris, France. Really? Come. 
and, but, and they they did artwork. They're all cartoonists and artists. So are these uh, are the articles based on interviews? Yes, or everything. It's mostly interviews. There's a few articles that are critical or things like record reviews. Review, yeah. And um, but mostly it's what I call primary source interviews. Right. By the and by the smartest people I could find. Right. Who were in the So you didn't the do the interviews, you had no. interviewers. Well, I or, did a did bunch of them. Of them. Yeah, yeah. But then people joined and, and what was great was like right away after issue number one came out, this really talented writer in England named John Savage joined. Mm -hmm. And he could do interviews with the cutting edge bands in England that I couldn't afford to go to England and interview. Right. Sure. And if you tried to do a phone interview with someone from England, it was over a dollar a minute. Right, right. I mean, I always think of punk rock, the main two locations, you know, New, New York, York City and, and London. LA. Well, yeah, in LA. London, London San, San Francisco no. had its share. Nah, we, I mean, we were never on the not radar. Not the same, right? No, we, but, our scene was just as good, but we didn't have any major media covering it. Right. Right. So our bands never got successful. The only band that really made it, first one, was a, a late punk band called the Dead Kennedys. Yeah, sure, the Dead Kennedys. We mentioned the Avengers. Um, yeah, they're the. I mean, they, they third yeah, band. Small, yeah, a small amount of recordings put out. But yeah, and she's still touring. Is she really? Europe, even. Yeah. Well, I don't, I don't doubt it. I, I, I mean, I'm a fan of her stuff, their stuff, and uh, certainly a fan of Dead Kennedys. So I saw this. This is the second, uh, second volume, yeah, and uh, you know that this has a list of, of bands that I'm just. I mean, Patti Smith, uh, Iggy, the Ramones, Devo, and the Clash. I mean, I was listening to these bands not in '77. I, I, in '77, I was 16 and not quite uh, uh, aware of it. But uh, two or three years later, these were my favorite bands. Yeah, yeah and uh, so I find it very interesting. So. What about like the relationship with like Rolling Stone, right? They were oh yeah, they were they were they here, covered punk rock. Way, they were way down on Third Street, and they covered punk rock. Nah, not that much. Really. Not much. Not that much. No. So yeah, I wonder why that is. Why wouldn't they have covered punk, punk rock? Because you know? they were totally in the hippie movement. Yeah, bands. even in '77. Oh yeah. Yeah. So they were. Oh, they were very successful. Crosby, Stills, and Nash. Well, I think by '77. They had actually moved to New York City. Yeah, that's probably it's right. It's always the dream of San Franciscans. Well, in order to make it, you have to move to New York City. Oh, that's a fascinating comment. So, uh, yeah, so that's where, if you if you make it here, that's where you go next. Is yeah. That, in, yeah. In media. Is yeah. that what you mean? And then almost anything. Or the arts. Oh, yeah. Almost anything. Yeah, fair enough. Especially the arts. Yeah, fair enough. But not tech. Tech, no, it's all here, right? Yeah, tech is here. Yeah, and, for sure. And down south. Yeah. Well, listen, you told me one other thing that you were in the original, uh, the original Cheer. band of Blue Cheer. Yeah, it was that's when it was six members. Six, we were that would have been sixty-seven, sixty-eight. Six, no, that was sixty. Sixty-six. Sixty-six. Around, I think I joined them in around August sixty-six. Okay. And um, the real summer of love was not sixty-seven; it was actually. 66. Oh, that's interesting you say that. So. Yeah, I'm sure of it. Yeah, well, I believe you. I lived it. I believe you. I mean, I lived it. 24 Ashbury in Street. Well, uh, that would have been the epicenter. It was. Yeah. It totally was. So, um, Blue Cheer, as you said, uh, you know, uh, regarded as certainly one of the first, if not the first, um, heavy metal band. Yeah, they're called the father of heavy metal. Yes. But we were actually... We were actually trying to beat Paul Butterfield Blues Band, but the thing is, we didn't have the depth of knowledge and skill that that band had. Right. Because they're from Chicago. Right. And, and they had all these original blues records from the south side of Chicago. Well, they had Michael Bloomfield. Too. Oh, Bloomfield, the genius. Yeah. And, and a, Heavy, heavy duty collector of blues records. Oh, he from knew all his over stuff. the world. Yeah, he knew his stuff. Yeah, yeah I love his work. He's so, great. tell you, 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 you told yeah, me. I that, knew him. Yeah. Did, did you really? Yeah, I, I he gave me uh, what Paul Oliver's big hardback book called "The Story of the Blues," and it came with a two LP uh, uh, set gatefold of, of records. 
he just hits the Chicago Blues. Do you still collect uh, vinyl or keep vinyl? Yeah, I have 10,000 vinyl albums. Do you really? Yeah. Well, that's something we can talk about. Oh. I have around that same number. Good. Yeah. So, uh, what, what are your, besides uh, heavy metal and blues and uh, hippie rock and punk rock, what else, uh, let's let that best. So what, what, what other genres besides the ones we've already talked about uh, do you go after in your collection? Well, I did these two groundbreaking books called Incredibly Strange Music, Volume 1 and 2. <laughs> and they were, because everyone in the punk scene that collected records and went to, we all of us mainly went to garage sales and right. thrift stores. Yes, and been there, flea, done that. And flea markets. Yeah, been and, there, done that. And, um, and we we all started collecting what I would call incredibly strange music records. Records that, what the hell is right. this? Who's, who's, way off the map. Yeah, I get you it. Know, so give me an example. Well, I don't know, The In Sound from Way Out by Perry and Kingsley. I know that. That's the yeah. one that's got kind of a space uh, yeah, it's kind photo of space. on the cover, right? Yeah, and, and, and kind of um, was that, was early that like synth. synthesizer, right? Early synth, yeah, and, yeah. but sound effects too. Right. And um, right. what you call found sound. Right. And um, yeah, I visited him in, in uh, Lausanne, Switzerland wow. before he died. Who was that? Uh, well, John John Curry. Oh. And I also sponsored a concert here, South of Market, he came here and met all his fans. Well, it's, Those are the good old days. Yeah, I mean, you've certainly the had you, I, I mean, I'm jealous listening to your experiences. That's uh, that's quite a uh, list of, and I know it's not even a complete list. So, so, how did you come up with the title "Search and Destroy"? Tell us a little. Well, about actually, that. in 1969, a book came out that I read called "Search and Destroy," and it was about uh, these four-person hit squads in Vietnam that Americans. That they were kind of assassination squad. Right. And, and it was a pretty scary book talking about the tunnels. Right. Because they, they were like miles of underground tunnels in Vietnam. Kind of a nightmare for soldiers trying to defeat the Vietnamese. Right. Well, they never did defeat the Vietnamese. Well, I know. And but you, but, but in, in it, so keep going. I don't mean to interrupt. Keep and going. Anyway, I read this book and it was so heavy. I, I thought it was a, I mean, I loved the title, Search and Destroy, but then it turned out that Iggy Pop had done a song called Search and Destroy, and so that's perfect. Well, that was perfect, what I was... Perfect title for a magazine. Going to ask about Because yeah. I wanted a, a title for a magazine that's a verb, not a noun. Right. You know, I mean, research is also a verb. Yeah, it can be. Yeah, I, well, oh, people do research. Well, it can be, a, it's, a, it's both a noun and a verb, right? Yeah. Yeah, it is. Yeah. But I prefer the verb. Yeah, well, it sounds like you're focused on action. Is that, yeah, action. That's the idea? That's the idea. We've been feeding pigeons, too, but they disappeared. You know, you had a whole cluster of pigeons, and then you briefly walked away, and they disappeared. Tell me that. Yeah, I'm sure they will. I think they live, a, you know, 50 feet behind me up in the rug. Yeah. Well, I hope we didn't scare them away, but... Um, <laughs> At any rate, listen, I, uh, I guess we should probably wrap this up, yeah. but I, this is going to be the first of many conversations, I hope. Okay. I sincerely hope. Okay. You're, uh, I, I, you know, I don't meet somebody like you every day. Good. Yeah. And vice versa. Well, I, you, know, <laughs> we, you know, we can get into my history. I, my history has almost nothing to do with uh, literature or, uh, or pop music. Science. Although, yeah, mostly science, but, um, but I am a fan. And I love uh, I love talking about music as well. So Good. I hope more to follow. Good. I don't mean to scare you. Okay. <laughs> All right.